Okay, everyone should have less than 40. We have been in the church of Thyatira, and that's why we studied Elijah. And you say, well, what does he have to do with Thyatira? Because he was impacted by the spirit of Jezebel. And so we took a, we've taken a couple of weeks off on a little rabbit trail over here, seeing how the spirit of Jezebel impacted him because Jesus has gone to the church of Thyatira and he's reviewing them and he brings up Jezebel in that church and they're tolerating her and allowing it. Today's lesson I've entitled, When Jesus Passes By. Boy, don't things change. When Jesus passes by. The letter to Thyatira was back in Revelation 2, and this is how he started to this church. He said to the angel of the church in Thyatira, These things says the Son of God. If you remember, this town worshipped Zeus, and Apollo was his son. And so that's why Jesus comes to this church and said, I am the Son of God. And notice how he comes to this church. Eyes are like a flame of fire, and his feet are burnished with brass. Do you hear the words judgment? Yes, because he's coming. His eyes are like flames of fire. His feet are burnished with brass, and brass in the Bible is always judgment. So he's coming to judge this church. And he said, the problem, you're allowing that woman Jezebel. She is, you're allowing her to teach and seduce people in the church, lead them out of the right path. And she's affecting what's going on in the church in a very negative way. So we wanted to see, that's why I've been with Elijah, because he was greatly impacted by the spirit of Jezebel and the fear of her. Now we started last week, and I told you to be looking in last week's lesson and in this one. Be looking for places where he had unrealized expectations. You and I, and I brought out how I even thought, if I just did all this, if I did A, B, C, then Laura would not go down that route of transgender. Well, I found out it didn't matter what I said because she was going to go down that route. So were my expectations not met? So that's exactly what was happening with Elijah. Then we have unrealistic expectations, things that we think are going to happen, but it's not really realistic for us to think that. So what happens? What happened with me even in the very beginning? You begin to lose focus. You begin to lose focus and you start turning inward. You start turning to your own strategies. How can I fix this? How can I fix this? And when it doesn't work, then you go into discouragement. You go into self-pity and despair. You start doubting God and his goodness and his faithfulness. He doesn't care about me or he would fix this situation. And he seems to let it go on and not really care about it. And finally, we find that you're crushed in your spirit. And that's where we found Elijah last week when we left him under the desert scrubby bush, under the broom tree, crushed in his spirit. So we, I'm going back just a little bit. We're going back to verse 3 for a minute. If you remember what had just happened in Elijah's life with the 850 prophets. Remember, God had just called fire down from heaven, and those 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtaroth had been massacred. But what happens? Ahab runs and tells Jezebel what happened. And she immediately puts a hit out on Elijah and sends a messenger to him. And verse 3 says, When he saw that, that messenger shows up and gives him the message from Jezebel, You will not be alive this time tomorrow. What does he do? I want out of this circumstance. And he's running for his life. Does that sound like the guy who's just had all the miracles and God's power displayed? No, but it's Jezebel. 
It's the spirit of Jezebel. So he runs for his life. He went to Beersheba. He got out of the northern kingdom of Israel where she had power, and he went to the southern kingdom in Judah. And he went to Beersheba, but he leaves his servant there. So from Jezreel, where he was when he got the message, he goes a 100 miles down to Beersheba. Now, he went a day's journey. I'm leaving my servant here. And he's going to go another day's journey out in the wilderness. And he's going to go and sit down under a broom tree. And this broom tree is not much for shade, but it's the best he can come up with at the moment. Remember, he's crushed in his spirit. He is depressed. And he asked for himself to die. And he said, enough now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. Can you imagine this coming from that man? I cannot. God has shown him over and over how he's taken care of him and the major miracles he's been able to perform. And now a lady says she wants to kill me. And he runs from her and becomes extremely discouraged. There's a truth here for you and me. Fear. When fear rises up within any of us, it hinders my faith, and I become blind to God's faithfulness. And I'm sure all of you have been in circumstances like that, and maybe the fear overtakes you for a while until you get your wits about you and you get back in the Word. Matthew 13, 22, Jesus said to the people, The worries of this life... When I start getting concerned about my circumstances, everything going on in this life, it will choke the word out of me so that the word really is unfruitful in me and the word's not having any effect on me. But in Isaiah 26, 3, God gave us a promise. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. That's what you and I have to do. We stay in the Word, and we stay here. We stay close to our anchor. We let the Word wash over us. We let the Word encourage us. And you get in the Word, and he says, I promise that you will have perfect peace. And I am a testimony of that. As I got into the Word and became saturated with the Word, God gave me a peace in a desperate situation. I had no idea how it would end, or when it would end, or if it would end. But He gave me a peace because He had me just get absorbed in this. The washing of the water of the Word over you. So what happens? Even though, do you know in your life that God has been faithful, you can recall a time maybe years ago, and you know God is faithful. You know it? Beyond the shadow of a doubt. But fear can keep you from living according to what we know to be true. I know God's faithful, but mercy, this, this situation, this situation, will he still be faithful? So the fear can cause you, I'm not living like I believe what I say I believe. And that's what I did for, for a very short time. Francine, isn't God faithful? Isn't he sovereign? Isn't he in control? Does he want Laura to not go down that path more than you? Yeah. Then why are you in the pit? See, that's what we're saying. The fear that it's not going to work out like I want or the fear that it's not going to end, it can cause me to start living and have those feelings and I'm living according differently than what I know to be true. And that's what he's doing here. Now, last week I introduced the chiastic structure. I know some of you thought this was wonderful, and some of you are like, I don't like that. I'm just reviewing it because this is a great way to study this chapter and many other chapters in the Bible. If you like diagramming sentences and going by outlines where you see what's coming, this is a great way to study the Bible. So we did a very easy one last year. We had a thought A and a thought B. And then you reverse it and do the opposite, and then you mention B again and then A again. 
So, example, the Sabbath, thought A, was made for man, thought B. Now, I'm going to repeat it, but, but I reverse it, not man for the Sabbath. That's called a chiastic structure. When a little bit more involved, whoever exalts himself, that's part A, he's going to be humbled, part B. Now, reverse it. Whoever humbles himself, B, he will be exalted. So, everybody, that's pretty easy to understand. Okay. This one is a little bit longer because we have an A, B, C, D. But it's the same thing. We're going to do thought A, B, C, D, and then E is going to be in the middle. And E is always like an X, and that's where things are going to change. And what's going to change here? In E, Jesus is going to come by. And now you do the opposite. You go back to D, C, B, and you end up with A again. So you and I are going to start at letter B, and Elijah's renewal will begin. And always what word are you looking for that makes you stop, look, and listen? Behold. And it's going to be mentioned five times in a few short verses in chapter 19. So here he is. He's laying under the broom tree. He's asleep. And we see the word behold. You are stop. And you look and you pay attention what's after behold. An angel is going to touch him. So the angel touches him and says to him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, stop. What's important? What's waiting for him? A cake that's been baked on the coals and water at his head. That's the second one. Now, he ate and drank, and he laid him down again. And we talked about how compassionate it is when you're in that state. You are just depressed. You, your spirit is crushed. And he's gentle, and he's tender with him. Gives him nourishment and just lets him sleep and go back to sleep and rest again. And we said last week, notice this special work of God's grace. It didn't occur when he's on the summit of Mount Carmel. It wasn't when he was in conflict with the prophets of Baal. He wasn't even by the brook that the, where the Lord had sent Elijah, nor was he in prayer and intimate fellowship. When did the angel appear? When did the angel nourish him and take care of him? He's in the wilderness, under the broom tree. His spirit is crushed. But he's out of fellowship with God because he had been given all these things he's supposed to do. It's his ministry, a prophetic ministry to the nation of Israel. And what does he do? He is sitting down there, lying down there under the broom tree. He's depressed and a deserter. Has he left his post? He left his ministry, and he wants God to kill him. He's under this scrubby desert bush. That was his place of refuge. You and I are told that God is our refuge and strength. So when we are in circumstances that are, the fear wells up within us, we're depressed or something like that, we are to go to God and to his word. He is our refuge and strength. We don't go hide under the desert bush alone, nurturing our feelings, self-pity. God is our refuge and strength, and he will be an ever-present help in trouble. So notice now the angel of the Lord comes again. Notice we have the word the. When you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. So the angel of the Lord comes again a second time, touches him, and said, you need to arise and eat. This journey you're going to go on, too great for you. I'm sure a lot of you have been on journeys, I have, that I thought I could not do it. There's no way I can go through this. That's how I felt after Laura's was uh, raped in 1996, and then the journey we went on with that, and the Satanism and all that, we thought we had her on a good place and then what happens in 2007 she starts taking hormones and then she transgenders and I thought I cannot go through any more with this kid I just can't we had had we paid 
$2,500 a month for 18 months to put her in a Christian home for emotional trauma. I mean, we were sacrificing to try to get her into a better place. And you know what? It worked for a while. And then we, we started all over again with something even worse. The journey is too great. And I cannot do it without God. There's no way I can do it without God. That's what he showed me. So this is a theophany or a Christophany. It was a manifestation of the second person of the Trinity. This was the Savior himself. He came personally to minister to Elijah. God didn't send the ravens like he did before. He didn't send the widow nor some other natural means. Jesus Christ himself, God sent him. So he was to show the prophet his love and grace. Had he left his ministry? Was he depressed? Was he having kind of a pity party? But Jesus shows up to nurture him, to bestow his grace on him. This reminds me, when I was a sinner, when you were a sinner and we were alienated from God, did God send his son for us then? Yes, and so because of where Elijah is, he's down under that desert bush, he's kind of alienated from God, and he's deserted his post, and who shows up? Jesus Christ himself, to nurture him and bestow his grace and love on him. This is a reminder the Savior never leaves us no matter how far we drift away, and some of us have drifted pretty far. He is personally involved in seeking to restore us. The Lord was not condoning what Elijah had done, nor was he overlooking it. What was he doing? I'm reassuring you, even in this circumstance where you are and your reaction to it, you are the object of his love. What a Savior that we serve. He still had a plan and a purpose for the prophet Elijah, just as he does for you and me when we seem to get out of his plan. And I'm sure many of us have had times where we kind of step out of his plan for our life. But he's nurturing, and he may bring something into your life to cause you to turn to him because he wants you back where he wants you. So he affirmed the power of God. Now the means may be completely lacking to us, and all can appear lost and without hope. Man, when I knew some of the things Laura was doing, I thought, there is no hope for this kid. You know, and you almost just want to wash your hands of it. Because what is it doing to your heart? It is like knives in your heart. It is gut-wrenching to see your child, especially the, the child you've invested in and the child that you've seen baptized, the child that you've seen give witness and testimony. And what are they doing? They are just, they seem, you think there's no hope. You can get to that point, and that's the enemy talking to you because as long as God is pursuing them and you're standing in the gap, is there hope? There's always hope, but the enemy can cause us to think there is not much hope here. There's never an end to the degree of God's love and care, nor to the capacity and power. Have you seen God's power do amazing things? <laughs> I tell you, Laura coming back was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And we had a banner for her wedding reception and her wedding. Look what the Lord has done. I have that by my computer because every time I can get a little discouraged. Look what the Lord has done. Remember what he's done. The power that he has. Will he do it again? Absolutely. And you have to keep your faith and you have to keep that in your mind. I've seen what he can do and I know he can do it again. God's power to supply any need at any time. So Elijah needed physical strength through nourishment. Remember, he's, he's been going a long way. He's in no condition to listen or take in the word of God. You know, sometimes if you're helping someone that's in a crisis or uh, they're having a, almost a breakdown because of the circumstances in their life, sometimes they need you to listen. Sometimes they just need you to be there. 
So that's what Elijah needed. He needed the nourishment physically first before God's going to reveal himself to him and really begin talking to him. He feeds him, he nourishes him, lets him rest. And he's told twice to eat and drink, and twice the angel allows him to sleep. So then he arose, and now he's going on to Mount Horeb. Remember, Mount Horeb is the other name for Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb in the Bible is called the Mountain of God. So he is headed in that direction because that's where many people have met God, is at Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai. So he's headed there, and he's going to go in the strength of that meat. That's what he's going to have for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, you, a, a bell should have gone off in your head. 40 days and 40 nights is in the Bible a lot. So it's significant that he tells us he's going to go from here to there 40 days and 40 nights, and he's on his way to Horeb, the Mount of God. He's going, we'll call it like a spiritual retreat. Many of us have had, and it may be in our own room where we study, but you go on a spiritual retreat. You, are, you feel far from God. Maybe your spiritual life feels kind of stagnant, not growing, and you need a retreat. And you can do it in your house. Draw near to God. So when Elijah awakens, he's told by the angel to get up, uh, the angel of the Lord, get up and eat because this journey is going to be too much for you. Many of the journeys that God has some of you on right now, it's, it's a hard journey. And you cannot do it without nourishment from God's word. You cannot. So the angel literally admitted this journey is too much for you to handle. That's exactly how I felt on my 40th wedding anniversary in July of 19, no, 2008 when Laura announced to us, I am transitioning. I've already been taking hormones for a year and I know that I'm going to become a man. The journey was too much for me to handle. And so I, I remember, you know, Paul and I, we had an hour ride home, and we didn't say one word. Not one word. It was quiet. And I, I don't know all what was going on in his head, but I know what was going on in mine. You know, this journey was going to be too much to handle. What the Lord was calling him to do, Elijah, was too much. Sometimes you feel like what God's asking you to go through is too much. And you can't handle it. But the Lord gave him strength. And the Lord provided everything that he needed to make the journey. And I can say that as a witness now that I'm on the other side of it. God gave me everything I needed. He gave me that through the whole journey. And you have to look back on those times in your life when you say, God gave me everything I needed here and here and here. Will he do it now when I'm in a real difficult journey? Yes. The answer is yes. God will send a difficult journey into your life and mine. What's he always trying to do? Conform me to the image of Christ. To accomplish his purpose in me. He wants to make us more like Jesus Christ. The psalmist says in Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You cannot make any journey if you don't get in the word and be strengthened by the word of God. You will not make the journey successfully. So we must be strengthened by the word of God to survive this journey. And I will say as I look back on that time, that was in 2008. By 2009, God had me teaching. And I thought, all that's going on, my, on in my life, you know, I did not feel like I should be the one teaching. But God opened the door, and I want to tell you, him forcing or opening the door, the privilege to teach his word, really was what got me through the next 10 years. Because I had to be in the word a lot to start teaching and so it was, it was being nurtured by the word of God. And he started giving me that peace. And he carried me through that whole journey. But where was I? I was always in this word, proclaiming truth, studying with these ladies. Come and grow with me. That's, 
That's what it was. Just come and grow with me. But it was getting in the Word. That's what kept my sanity. That's what kept me from wanting to be under the desert bush, feeling sorry for myself. God lifted me out of all of that. Elijah's spiritual retreat. God wants to create in him a deeper dependence on the Lord. That's why you have these spiritual retreats. You need to learn to depend on me more and more and more. So if you look at the map here, up in the, you see the little red rectangle in the top? Okay, this is Beersheba. And that's where he had run to. And so then he goes a day's journey. Remember, he leaves the servant. But he is on his way to the yellow box down in the corner. You see it? Okay, now that is Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Up where the red rectangle is is Beersheba, but here's Beersheba, and then there's the boundary of the nation of Israel, and then you've got Kadesh Barnea, just south of the red box. Y'all with me? Okay, so if I go to Deuteronomy, God said... From Kadesh Barnea, remember he had them down here at Mount Horeb at Mount Sinai. He said, we're going up here to the promised land and we're going to enter at Kadesh Barnea. And he said, it's a how long journey? 11 days. So the journey that Elijah made from the red box down to the yellow box should have taken 11, maybe 12 days at the most. That's what it should have taken. Now... From where Elijah began his journey, a day's journey south of Beersheba, he was not 40 days and nights from mountain. He was only 11 or 12. So what's going on that it's going to take him 40 days and 40 nights to do this journey? A straight strip. No, sorry. A straight trip. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, boy. A straight trip <laughs> from the broom tree should have required 11 or 12 days but what's wrong it's going to take him 40 days and 40 nights to make the trip so do you think it's possible God has him wander about like the children of Israel did for 40 years that's a possible thing so let's look at it a little bit the fact that this took 40 days, does that tell you he's still weak and depressed? Yes. He averaged only five miles a day. Well, just a short time ago, he ran 17 miles, and he outran the chariot of Ahab. So now he's only going about five miles a day. He seems to be crawling. Have you ever felt like you were crawling in your journey? Yes. He's physically and emotionally weak, and God is trying to teach him, you have got to learn to lean on me and trust God more, even in this circumstance. So remember, 40 days and 40 nights has spiritual significance in the Bible. Y'all all know that, right? Okay. The children of Israel had a significant spiritual failure at Kadesh Barnea due to what? unbelief and fear that's what hebrews tells you i think in chapter three this led to their judgment and god said you're going to wander around 40 years in the wilderness that's from numbers 14 so perhaps have we seen that elijah is now in unbelief that god can take care of him that god's going to work is he in fear the spirit of jezebel maybe that's why his journey is going to take him 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, another thought. The, there's uh, several places in the Bible where someone has to undergo a 40-day fast. Remember it said when he was fed the second time, he's going to go in that, that food that he has there, he's going to, that's going to sustain him through the journey. That's, that's what he has. So Jesus fasted 40 days and then when he finished his fast, what happened? God empowered him through the Holy Spirit. 
for his earthly ministry. So during that fast, when he comes out of that in the temptation, did he receive God's divine enablement to go into his ministry now? Yes, and it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to go into Galilee. Now, before God gave Moses the law, he fasted 40 days on Mount Sinai, and he was sustained only by God while he's awaiting a new phase of service. Had he taken them out of, had he been the deliverer God used to bring them out of Egypt in bondage? Yes, but now at Mount Sinai, he's going to experience a 40-day fast because God's going to have him lead them to the promised land. And God's teaching them the law. God's teaching them how to do the, the tabernacle and the worship and the sacrifices. So Elijah is supposed to spend now 40 days out there in the wilderness, and he's got to rely on God's divine enablement. Because he's being prepared, God is going to give him a recommissioning at the end of this, at the end of chapter 19. So no doubt, God would use Eliza's struggle with his depression for the good. Does God promise to take all things and work them for our good? Is Elijah depressed? Yes, probably more depressed than a lot of us have ever been. He would draw Elijah to a time of great weakness, 40 days in that wilderness. And the Bible does not tell us he had any other nourishment. Learning to depend on God for 40 days. And then when that's over, God's going to reveal himself to Elijah in a very special way, very unique. Now, we all know the scripture from James, and I'm going to throw it in here. Because this is the attitude you and I are to have when we face dire circumstances and trials. Count it all joy. My brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials, be assured, this is from the Amplified, be assured that the testing of your faith through these experiences you're going through, they're going to produce endurance in you, leading you to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And then we're commanded to let endurance have its perfect result. Man, do a thorough work in us. So we'll be perfect or mature, completely developed in our faith, lacking in nothing. Do you see your attitude makes all the difference in the world? I consider it joyful, not joyful that I'm going through being the mother of a transgender and all that that involved, but joyful that God's going to use this to transform me more into the image of his son, to develop my faith, to lean on God more, and to mature me and grow me. That's what you're joyful in. So, I see a parallel to God's promises from Isaiah 43. 31 when I look at the life of Elijah for three years that's your scripture they that wait upon the Lord okay three years was the prophet hidden by God before he came on the scene yes and during that time he's waiting on the Lord but he's hidden now the Lord sends him to Mount Carmel and now he's going to enable Elijah to mount up with wings as eagles and triumph over the prophets of Baal. Don't you know that was a highlight of his ministry? Okay, don't y'all know that was a highlight of his ministry? Oh, thank you. Now, then after that, all the prophets are massacred, and what does he do? There's been a, a three-year drought and he starts praying after that, and it began to rain. So the Lord has strengthened him, him to run and not be weary. Did he outrun Ahab's chariot back to Israel? Right. Now, God's going to sustain him for 40 days so he can walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, to wait on you. Teach me, Lord, to wait. So, no doubt, God had allowed Elijah to be especially weak during the journey. Do you ever feel like your faith is wavering a little when you're in the depths of something? Sure we do. 
God's going to bring him to such a weakened place, he has to count on God more and more to get him through the journey. He wants us to lean on him, rely on him. You get special strength through him. Not only for the journey, but most importantly for the ministry that he's got for him when he's done with him. So isn't this another indication of the grace of God? Even when I get out of fellowship, my heart's kind of devising my own way and my own strategies for how I can fix all everything, how I can react. The Lord's working on behalf of his children's needs. He wants us to go back to him always back to him I was listening to a sermon on this the other day and this statement just kind of jumped out at me he said many of us this is under the broom tree we suffer the paralysis of self-analysis he said we always focus on ourselves you know just like me you know with Laura and the victim of a sexual crime and her and Satan I'm the only one you know all these other mothers in the church their kids are doing great you know and you you start feeling guilty because people know you they know your testimony they they've seen the child grow up in the church and they've seen her you know participate in all these different things and go to Christian school and you just think I am such a failure as a mother now, if you've never felt that, God bless you, because I have felt it a lot. You know, and that's not what I'm supposed to feel. That's the enemy working on me. Self-analysis here, I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. God can't use me. You know, and I remember Laura saying that, I don't think God can ever use me. I've done too many bad things. You know, so that's that self-analysis, and we get paralyzed by that, and the enemy can really work on us. This is an illustration also of how prone we are <laughs> prolonging our trek in the wilderness. Now let that sink in. Because we're not putting our faith and trust, we're not leaning on him, we're devising our own strategies, we can actually prolong my journey out in that wilderness. That's what they did. Because I come up with my own solutions to my pain and misery rather than quickly turning to the Lord when that situation or that circumstance comes up. Why do we do that? We tend to believe so strongly in my own solutions. Pride, our sensitive egos. We do not like to admit we're wrong. And pursuing a wrong course. That's just in all of us. Some of us, in more, it's in some of us more than others. But as Moses was to see the presence of God, remember when Moses and God passed by? Elijah was going to find God now, though in a different way than he could ever imagine. By God's divine grace and providence, He's going to sustain, he was sustained like Israel was sustained through the 40 years. Even though they were out in the wilderness on this long journey, did God make sure they had food? Did their clothes wear out? Their shoes? God sustained them. And he drew them to Horeb, to Mount Sinai. And when he got them there, he is going to reveal himself to them in a spectacular way. We go to Exodus 19. The children of Israel have crossed the Red Sea. They have had the bitter water turn sweet. They've, Elijah, uh, Moses has struck the rock once, and he's got them at Mount Sinai. And here's what he says. Moses went up to the mountain of God, and the Lord called him and said, Here's what I want you to tell those Israelites. You have seen for yourself how I treated the Egyptians. Had they seen spectacular things in Egypt? Yes, yeah, some of you know that. Okay. And how I bore you up on eagles' wings, and God brought the whole nation of Israel right here to Mount Sinai. He said, I brought you to myself. Therefore, if you will hearken to my voice and keep my covenant, you get to be a special treasure 
a special possession, dearer to me than all the other people, though all the earth is mine. And he said, you people, I want to make you a kingdom of priests. I want to make you a holy nation. Go tell the Israelites that's why they're here. So it says in uh, the next verse, here they are at Mount Sinai. It's covered with smoke. The Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. What do you think's going on in their minds? It's the presence of God himself. And he's displaying himself in a spectacular way. And remember, the people told Moses, you go talk to God, we're going to stand back here. They didn't even want to approach. The people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. They saw the noise of the trumpet, the mountain is smoking. And when they saw it, they removed and stood afar off. This is a fear of the Lord. His presence. We are to humble ourselves before him. And what is, what is a major problem in most churches today and in the lives of Christians? No reverential awe and fear of the Lord God. People are hearing too much about the grace of God, the love of God, and yes, all that's true. But they don't hear the other side of the coin. He is a God that's coming with eyes of fire, feet burnished with brass, and he's coming in judgment. And they don't hear that. When I hear people say, oh, God's just, he's just like a good friend to me. We need a reverential awe and fear of him and his holiness and who he is. So Elijah goes in the cave. He's out from under the bush, and now he's in the cave. And he spends the night there. And the cave, according to one commentator, said, may represent, I've got another human strategy for refuge which was a much better source than sitting under that broom tree. Was the cave a substitute for God as his refuge? Mm, we'll see. His spirit, is his spiritual condition when he arrives, is it still in shambles? Yes. He's still in shambles. God hasn't touched him yet. So now you and I in our chiastic structure are going to go to letter C. And this is verses 9 and 10. The word of the Lord comes. Behold. What do we do? Stop. See what's after behold. The word of the Lord came to him in the cave. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Can you imagine? That's kind of how I felt right after Laura announced all this. And I mean, I am just on my face. Sobbing. I'm at home. You know, how is all this going to work out? Why is this happening to us? And blah, blah, blah. And you just almost hear, what are, what's wrong with you? What? Yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing here? You know, it's a soul-searching question. We are to consider the motives of our heart. God is always wanting to examine the motives of our heart. If you don't know those verses in Psalms about examining your heart, search me, O God, and know my heart, and all of and Create in me a clean heart. You need to find those, mark them, write them down, and pray those over yourself so that your heart becomes the heart that he desires. Often during times of trial and pursuing God, he exposes the sin in our heart and begins to work on them. And I remember I was going to the Bible study in Whistler's house. <clears throat> we, I was working through all of this. And the more I got in the word the more God was revealing sin in my life. You know, sin from a long time ago. And I told you, for about six months, I felt like I had a rotor rooter job. You know, cleaning this heart out. You know, getting me to the point where I needed to be. Exposing our insecurities, wrong views about myself, wrong views about God, and wrong views about others. All of that needed to be uh, rooted out of me. But does not this illustrate the word of God? What does it do when we get in it? It reproves us. It exposes us to our failures, our false belief systems, and it exposes us to God's grace. 
So we see from Hebrews 4.12, you've got to get in the Word of God because this is what's alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it will judge the desires and thoughts of your heart. You want your heart cleaned out? Get in the Word because that's one of the, the purposes of being in the Word, one of its actions. When we hear God's Word preached, when we hear it taught, if I will get in and really study his word, which is a command, I hope you're being obedient to that command, I'm hearing the voice of God. Somebody says, I don't think God ever talks to me. He does. We're hearing the voice of God, and in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, I think it is, it says, when you get in the word, this will work effectively in you. It will work in you, but you've got to get in it. So, do you think Elijah understood he's there because of his faulty thinking and his wrong focus? <laughs> We're going to see by his answer. He doesn't, that hadn't occurred to him yet. He has been running from the Lord. It's God who led him to this very special place. God's got some instructions for him, and he wants to restore him so he can get up from that place of uh, discouragement and despair. But God's got to expose and root wrong things out of Elijah during this time because he's got to strengthen him for what he has for him later. Remember Joshua. They had a great victory at Jericho. You remember? It was awesome. So when they come to Ai, which was a much smaller place, they, didn't, they thought they could... Uh, defeat this one is be a piece of cake and so they didn't uh, they didn't ask for God's uh, counsel and advisement and what happened they lost and they even lost some of their people some of their men Joshua is broken hearted because of Israel's defeated Ai and he spent a day on his face before God before the altar of God remember you can see the altar here with blue cover on it so that represented God's presence, right? So they are in, they're bowing in humility before God. He rent his clothes, he fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and all the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their head. We lost. And they spend the whole day like this. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites and destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. He does not sound like the leader. He sounds like one of them that had been murmuring and complaining. Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their back before their enemy? The Canaanites and all the inhabitants are going to hear of it, and they're going to come around us and cut off and cut off your name from the earth. And what will you do about your great name? And what did God say to him? Get up and get your face out of the dirt. Israel has sinned, and there's sin in the camp. They have violated my covenant, covenant commandment. The Israelites will never be able to stand before your enemies. Oh, there's a good piece of advice for us. They retreat because they become subject to annihilation. I will no longer be with you unless you destroy what's contaminating you. Wow. Has that sunk in? Let him root out. Make your heart clean. Make your heart pure. I will no longer be with you unless you destroy what has contaminated you. Get up. Ritually tell the people to consecrate themselves for tomorrow because this is what the Lord God of Israel has said. You are contaminated, O Israel. You will not be able to stand before your enemies until you remove what is contaminating you. And so here's Elijah's response. What are you doing here, Elijah? I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel, they have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And now they want to take my life and take it away. I don't think he understands yet why he's there. 
He doesn't get it. He's scratching his head. I don't get it, Lord. Why? He's filled with his own importance. His own, his angry, he's angry over the lack of response and help from others, including God. All he's done, and now they want to take his life. He's running. He's been under the desert bush. He is depressed. Jezebel, that spirit of Jezebel, has crushed him in his spirit. He's bitter because I've served the Lord earnestly and spectacularly and still. Look at this. I'm rejected and I'm in exile. It seems that Elijah had hoped that that miraculous occurrence at Mount Carmel would lead to the reform of the nation. When God does this spectacular thing, we are going to have a revival. Jezebel and Ahab are going to repent. All of this is going to happen. But on the contrary, everything that he did seemed to have no effect whatsoever on the political situation. Who's still on the throne? Jezebel. And she ordered his death. He's got temporary amnesia. And he forgot the Lord's word. So the word of Jezebel, you hear the spirit of fear? The word of Jezebel drowns out the word of the Lord. The fear of a person replaced the fear of Almighty God. Like Elijah, you and I will always battle between hearing God's word more clearly than hearing a human that maybe is ridiculing us, scoffing at us, persecuting us for different things. And that voice rings loud in our hearts and in our ears. In Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man will lay a snare or a trap before you. But if you will trust in the Lord, you will be safe. You and I easily fear people instead of fearing God. And we all, I'm sure we all struggle with it. We want people to like us. We don't want people to be ridiculing us. We don't want people to be talking about us. You know what it's like. And all of us have that desire to want to be liked and people not uh, talking about us behind our backs. But the fear of a man will lay a snare, and we better be fearing God. So we're going to letter E now, which is the middle of the structure here, and we get the central idea of this whole chapter. God is now going to pass by. So he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Remember, he's in the cave. And God tells him, you're going to come out of the cave, stand before the Lord, the presence of the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. A very important event now in the life of Elijah because God is going to pass by. Elijah needs to be renewed for service all of us sometimes what you need is just to get alone if you get discouraged have a fresh vision of the power and glory of God a fresh vision of the cross and the resurrection that's what a lot of us need sometime to kind of light our fire again we'll say no before Elijah comes out of the cave though four events are going to occur he's still in the cave while these happen three of them are spectacular and behold, there's our word again, the Lord passed by, a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Surely such a spectacular event such as this would announce the presence of the Lord and illustrate how he's going to work in the future. But was the Lord in that? No, he wasn't. So after the wind and earthquake, it says shaking even the foundations under his feet. But did he find God in the earthquake? No. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire, even that did not announce presence or activity of the Lord. All of these physical phenomena were known to be precursors of God's coming or presence. We saw them at Mount Sinai. 
We've seen him in other places, fire for the three Hebrew children. We've seen different things where God's presence was announced by something spectacular. These represent the grand and powerful events that will capture our attention. Think about, about back to Mount Horeb and Sinai again. This was the holy mountain where God first revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. Think about Mount Horeb. God spoke the Ten Commandments with thunder and lightning and a very thick cloud. And then on the top of Mount Horeb, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. The pagan nations saw all these manifestations, and what did they do? They worshipped the powers of nature. But many times when the Jews saw these things, what did it do for them for a short time? They worshipped the God who created those things. They saw the presence of God in the fire and the wind and so forth. Now, just as a side note... These same demonstrations of the awesome presence of the power of God, we're going to see those again. In the last days, when Jesus returns to earth to establish his kingdom, this is the day of the Lord. It says, you will feel like you have failed to judge the sin in Israel. Did Elijah feel that way? He thought God was there and was going to be, he was going to, God was going to use him to help judge the sin. But yet it didn't do anything. And so God said, one day I'm going to judge it. I am going to judge that sin, and all rights will, all wrongs will be made right. And my judgment is final and complete. So the fact that God was not in any of these, he wasn't in the wind, he wasn't in the earthquake, he wasn't in the fire, that is tremendously significant. He was not in any of it. If I go to Psalm 148... God reminds us everything in nature is obedient to God. Is that not true? The sun, the moon, the stars, the host of heaven, the angels, everything is obedient to him. God doesn't lack for a variety of tools to get his work done. He can use anything he wants to get his work done. If Elijah wants to resign from his divine calling, God has someone else to take his place. Someone else. I love this statement that I read by a commentator. All of us occupy an interim position because God's work will live on. And if we don't take up and do what he's called us to do, he can find somebody else. And after we pass on, he will have somebody else to carry the work. All of us are just an interim in our position here. So after the fire, this still small voice, the faint whisper, quiet, hushed and low, God doesn't always operate in the realm of the spectacular. In this day of mammoth meetings, loud music, high-pressure promotion, it's very difficult for people to understand. God rarely works by means of the dramatic and the colossal. He doesn't. When he wanted to start the Jewish nation, who did he send? A baby, Isaac. Then, when he wanted to deliver that nation from bondage, who did he send? A baby, baby Moses. Then he sent a teenager named David to kill the Philistine giant. David just used a sling and a stone and the power of God to be able to do that. When God wanted to save this world, who did he send? A baby. His son came as a weak and helpless baby. Today, how does God want to uh, do his work? through broken vessels. We are earthen vessels, 2 Corinthians 4 says. We're just in earthen vessels, and he wants us to be broken before him so that the power that's within us, that treasure that's within us, will be made manifest to the people around us. It's God working in me and through me. We are to be those broken earthly vessels. Dr. Oswald Sanders says, the whispers that come from Calvary 
are infinitely more potent than the thunder of Sinai in bringing a man to repentance. It's that voice, the Holy Spirit, working in the heart. That's what will bring a man to repentance. So why did God allow this windstorm, the earthquake, and fire to come by the mountain, though he wasn't in them? And then he's going to reveal himself in a whisper. Elijah had become dependent on God revealing himself in miraculous and powerful things. So he expected God to do the same during his troubling circumstance. God, don't you know they want to kill me? There hadn't been a revival. Nothing's changed. He's expecting something spectacular, some miracle from God. He has unrealized expectations. That's how it starts. God had moved in Elijah's life through many miracles. He stopped and he started the rain in response to his prayers. Prayed to stop the rain, then he prayed for it to start, and God worked. He provided food through ravens and angels. He was able to resurrect the dead, and he brought fire down from heaven. Maybe Elijah was depressed because he expected God to move miraculously again when he's thrown into a circumstance and Jezebel wants to kill him. Maybe he expected Jezebel to repent when she saw everything God did. You know, God's sovereign hand over the events of life doesn't always guide circumstances as we want or even pray that it would. Sometimes God's will for you and me is a very difficult path instead of an easy path or the one we think would be best. Essentially, God was challenging Elijah with, and I want you to listen to this question, Would you be content if God in your circumstance only provided you his presence and his word, but he never gave you the miracle? Would I be content if all I have is his presence in my life and I have his word, but I don't see the miracle? Would I be content? How does God's way of doing things challenge me? Is God's presence in his word enough, even if my circumstances don't change? Because he may not change my circumstance, but he promises he will be with me during the circumstance. And my attitude should be, God, that's enough. It is enough. God told Paul, who prayed three times to have the thorn in his flesh removed, and God said no. What did he say? I want you to create a deeper dependency on God. My grace is sufficient for you, and my power, God's power, will be made perfect or complete in our weakness. In the Amplified, Hebrews 13 says, Let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature, be free from the love of money, shun greed, and be financially ethical. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless. Nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. And then he goes on to say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can a man do to me? And then he says, Your faith needs to be bigger than your fear. Your faith needs to be bigger than your fear. So we go on in our chiastic structure. This will go much quicker now. We're going to do letter D1 and C1. Now we're doing the reverse. So it was so when Elijah heard it, that still small voice, what does he do? He now is going to go stand in the entrance of the cave, and he's going to take his face and wrap it with his mantle. And he's going to go out and stand in the entrance of the cave. 
This is a sign of reverence and humility before God. His response shows, is God revealing himself to him in that still small voice? And he's beginning to see now. He's to uh, humble himself before the Lord. He covers his face to indicate his unworthiness in the presence of the divine. God's presence and revelation can be found in unexpected ways. And you and I, the challenge here is to ask the Lord for spiritual discernment. God's presence, we are to seek it, not just in the extraordinary. I seek God in the ordinary moments of my life. But this requires humility and patience, a willingness to just be quiet and listen for God's voice in the quietness of our heart. And behold, second time, Elijah, why are you here? Why are you doing? Why are you here? The Lord ignored his first answer for his self-justification, his reason why I'm even on this mountain. Why are you here, Elijah, and what are you doing here? Why are we having to have this conversation? This simple yet profound question cuts to the heart of Elijah's despair, his sense of abandonment. Has he felt abandoned by God? Yes. It forces him to confront the reasons for why he ran, his feelings of isolation, his feelings of hopelessness. He's challenged, examine your purpose and examine your calling, the ministry that God called you to. He was to be a prophet. Every decision Elijah had made up until this moment was motivated by a direct call from the Lord. He didn't do much of anything unless God told him. He was always seeking God, but fear. Fear of the spirit of Jezebel. Doubt came into his mind. The Lord, if you look back in your scripture and make yourself a note, the Lord never commanded him to run from Jezreel to Beersheba. Never. He did that on his own. That's what started the journey when he ran away from his circumstance. Listen to him again. Second time. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel, they forsook the covenant, they threw down your altars, and they slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. He comes back with the same answer of why he is there. How slow you and I are to learn. How deep-seated your feelings. Can they get really deep-seated with deep roots of your rejection, your hurt? Boy, can they become established in our hearts. And I keep clinging to that as my way of escape and defense for why I'm here, why I'm depressed, why I'm in despair. I keep clinging to those things. Depression that is not caused by physical problems, and I realize there is some, but this kind of depression, it's one of our methods of escape. It's a human strategy for dealing with pain and disappointment. The irony is we seem to be willing more to depend on our depression as a solution than we are to trust in the Lord and go to him and lean on him for our, for our dependency. He still doesn't get it. He still wants the Lord to bring immediate judgment. Why aren't you judging them, God? Elijah may have gone to ask God to judge Jezebel and Ahab. He wanted a speedy judgment on the nation. He wanted God to be in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire. He wanted God. God, where's that quick anger? But instead, God comes in that gentle whisper, that still small voice. Spurgeon says, That which effectually wins a human heart to God and to Christ is not an extraordinary display of power. Men can be made to tremble when God sends pestilence and famine and fire and others of his terrible judgments. We've seen that when we have devastation of hurricanes and earthquakes and, and those kind of things. Do you hear people wanting to pray? I do. 
Sometimes they say, we need to pray. We need to turn to God. You know, after 9-11 and different things, do you see a little bit of a change? And all of a sudden, people who don't even believe in God or worship Him, they think, we need to pray. But these things end usually in a hardening of a man's heart. Think about Pharaoh. Think about Pharaoh. And you don't usually win them. Think about all the miracles, the people that followed Jesus around for the miracles and the food he was providing. But what happened when he said, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. That did not win them. He leaves the wind, Spurgeon says. He leaves the earthquake and the fire, and he's going to speak to men in the silence of their souls. By a voice which, though it be as silence, audible. Do you know when God lays something on your heart, talking to you in your heart? Yet that silence audible is the power of God to salvation, the Holy Spirit working in someone. He says, the voice which is not heard without is omnipotent within. Let's go on to the next section, letter B, and we're going to see Elijah's renewal is now complete, and he has new instructions Verse 15, God says to him, I want you to go back the way you came, go back to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram or Syria, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel, and go find Elisha and anoint him to succeed you as a prophet. He tells him, Jehu's going to kill anyone who escapes Hazael's sword. Elisha's going to kill anyone who escapes Jehu's sword. So God reveals himself to Elijah, and he gives him a renewed purpose, gives him three instructions. He assured Elijah, justice is going to take place, not immediately, but soon. Go anoint those three men, and they are going to, I'm going to use them to bring down judgment on Ahab and the nation of Israel. Haziel, the Syrian king, will inflict losses upon the army of Israel. Jehu is going to come wipe out Ahab's line. And Elisha is going to predict a seven-year famine on the land. Is judgment going to come? Yes. So the anointing of Jehu and Elisha represents the passing of authority and the continuation of God's plan for Israel. Elisha, as Elijah's successor, is going to play a crucial role in preserving the faithful remnant and continuing the prophetic ministry in Israel. In verse 18, God's finally going to let him in on a secret. He says, I've reserved 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So David Guzek says, Elijah's powerful victory at Mount Carmel faded quickly, like the next day. Remember? Remember? And he made him think, my whole life, my ministry has been a waste. And that he had made no real impact on God's people. Guzek says, he looked at the facts through gray-colored glasses of unbelief. And he allowed his imagination to hold more power than the facts before him. The call of Elisha and the 7,000 who had not bowed to Baal uh, showed Elijah... Elijah, your ministry has not been in vain. God's word doesn't return void, no matter how things may look to us. Your nation is not going to be totally exterminated, and there's going to be people to carry on the work of the Lord. And then we go to letter A, Elijah returns to the world and to his prophetic ministry. I have a question for you and me. The question, why are you downcast? David asked himself that in Psalm 42. Why are you in despair? Why are you depressed? And the psalmist is going to give us the answer. So I want you and me and our hearts to answer the question. If you feel downcast in any way, in despair, depressed, why? Here's the remedy. And we need to apply it. He says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become restless and disturbed within me? Here's our solution. 
hope in God. Wait expectantly for him. For I shall again praise him. So we have three actions. Hope, wait, and praise. And praise him and thank him for the help of his presence in our life. Let's pray. Father, how I thank you for the instructions given to us through this chapter because all of us have experienced feelings of despair. We thought the journey was too hard, that the circumstances that you allowed to come into our lives. And Lord, we ask ourselves, why am I in despair? Why am I distressed? Why is my soul downcast? Oh God, may we look at the psalmist remedy, which is in your word. May we hope in God. May we wait for you expectantly. And God, how we praise you for your presence in our lives as we go through these struggles. Thank you for your word, how it washes over us. It strengthens us. Oh God, may we be motivated to get in the word even more, especially in times where we feel in despair. Because you will strengthen us in the journey, and we just thank you for that and give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen.